Emily Dickinson, The Classicist by Jenny Olson. When people hear of the American poet Emily Dickinson, they often think of a reclusive woman writing on napkins whose work was published mostly posthumously. Dickinson was known for not accepting the expected roles of wife and mother, like most women of her time. While people who knew her personally may have known of her indomitable will and mind, she's often marketed as a woman who was sad and lonely and very uncomfortable with being around other people. What one finds instead when reading her work is a woman who studied the classics, who taught a classical education, who was taught a classical education, and who wrote poetry reflective of that education. Previously, women had not been taught a classical education, only men, but this changed dramatically in the 19th century. According to modern historian Caroline Winterer, Victorian American women stormed an ancient male intellectual and political bastion through equity and classical education. In the 19th century, Americans were practically obsessed with the classics, considered second only to the Bible for training the great minds of the nation. Dickinson shows her knowledge of Roman and Greek history with her poetry. Poem 76 mentions Cato. In Vincent Cleary's article, Emily Dickinson's Classical Education, he notes, her knowledge of Roman history was not superficial as shown by the two Cato poems. There were two important Romans named Cato in the Republican period, Cato the censor and Cato the younger, a Stoic philosopher, contemporary and friend of Cicero, an arch enemy of Julius Caesar. The first poem seems to be showing how nature outdoes philosophy. Her reference to Cato in the second stanza makes sense because he was well known historically for his oratory skills. In poem 149, Emily is probably referring to her brother as Caesar. So perhaps a man who thinks too much of himself and is filled with pride. She's requesting that he receive her, the daisy, who has been gathered by Cato's daughter. Again, Emily's knowledge of Roman history is shown as she references Portia, Cato's, Cato's daughter. It seems as if this poem is calling her brother out a bit, but in a teasing way. Dickinson scholar William Patrick Jeffs explains Dickinson's milieu demanded that women be pious, innocent, and mere wives and mothers, but she mocks these prescribed strictures on her sex, pretending to be an impish, asexual, white-robed, frail daisy. Her true self that resides underneath this facade reveals quite the opposite, revealing a woman who wrote powerfully in rebellion against God and who wrote vividly about sexual passion. Dickinson seems to write within the parameters relegated to women of her era while mocking those parameters the entire time. Dickinson's knowledge of Greek history is shown in the next two poems and is likened to what was happening in the world around her at the time, the Civil War. As a matter of fact, it looks like Dickinson questioned war itself and the lives lost at such a cost. In poem 524, she references the famous stance the Spartans took as they held a pass from the Persians and died to the last man. This wouldn't necessarily be a well-known piece of Greek history that everyone knew, but Dickinson drew an analogy to the colossal loss of life happening in the Civil War. She begs the question, are we that weighed sufficient worth that such enormous pearl as life dissolved be for us in battle's horrid bowl? She writes this poem in 1863 in the thick of the Civil War. War always necessitates death, but is that too much? Her second poem about the same Greek historic event is written several years later, in 1882. She almost directly references the Greek poet Simonides, who wrote of the 300 Spartans, Traveler, go tell it to the Lacedaemonians that we who obey the law of our country lie here. Dickinson's 1584 poem starts out with, go tell it, what a message, and ends with, to law, sweet Thermopylae, I give my dying kiss. Dickinson seems to once again be pointing out the terrible cost for the Greeks, but in almost quoting directly from Simonides, she shows a clearer knowledge than one would expect. She is commentating on the cost of war and whether or not it's worth it. Dickinson also speaks of Greek mythology and her poetry with ease. In her poem 255, she compares herself to a drop of water approaching the sea. The last stanza in the poem is the ocean's response to the drop of water. The ocean smiles at her conceit, but she, forgetting Amphitrite, pleads me. Her reference to Amphitrite might be overlooked because in the general scheme of Greek mythology, Amphitrite is a lesser-known goddess as queen of the sea and wife of Poseidon. In this poem, as Dickinson represents herself as a tiny drop of water, she seems to be pulling the sweet little woman trope again. Ursula Kaki, looking at gender relationships in Dickinson's writing, explains, Individuals in Dickinson's poetry have limited agency. Rather than revolutionizing the whole of society, they make mutual decisions that apply only within the frame of their relationship. Dickinson addresses her convictions with each individual poem that she writes. 
Another myth where Dickinson refers to and shows a great deal of knowledge of Greek mythology is poem 910 and her references to Jason and the Golden Fleece. In the first stanza of the poem, Dickinson seems to acknowledge Jason's quest born out of loss of kingdom and home. In the second stanza, Dickinson seems to commentate on what is eventually learned about Jason. This epic hero is actually a terrible human being who doesn't overcome obstacles on his own, but only through the power of his wife, the wife he eventually leaves for a younger woman. Jason isn't heroic, and many of the myths of heroes are about terrible humans enacting dastardly deeds on others. Dickinson seems to call mythology and the classics out because of her classical education and her ability to see them from the perspective of other. One of the best examples of Dickinson's knowledge of the classics also shows her knowledge of sacred text. She attacks the Bible using mythology. In poem 1577, Dickinson attacks the writers and texts of the Bible by saying, the Bible is an untold volume written by unknown men. She takes on male writers, the Holy Spirit, as well as heroes and important themes of the Bible. Ultimately, she suggests, had the tale of warbling teller, all the boys would come. Orpheus' sermon captivated, it did not condemn. She seems to be suggesting a different teller of the sacred tale, perhaps herself. And she notes that Orpheus is a good example of a storyteller because his songs captivate and compel instead of ridiculing and condemning their audience. Eric Athenot seems to suggest in Dickinson's writing, this higher form of singing may be what Dickinson aimed at all her life, to become a female Orpheus, thereby freeing women of their position as minor poets or Eurydice-type lyrical objects. She may absolutely be suggesting that women step off the page and begin writing their own story. As sacrilegious as it may seem, she seems to be implying that the Bible would be better received had other people been part of writing it, which is a case made by many who see huge swaths of the Bible as sexist, racist, and outdated. Dickinson also gives tribute to poetry in general in books with one of her most appreciative poems, 569, A Precious Molder and Pleasure Tis. In this poem, she describes the act of opening an old book in such a romantic and compelling way. As she notes the people whose ideas are found in old books and ponders when they were alive and writing, she mentions philosophers, Plato and Sophocles, some of the most profound thinkers of their own eras whose writing impacted all of Western civilization. She mentions Sappho, who perhaps she felt a commonality of sisterhood with. She mentions Beatrice, who was made famous by Dante, and although his work is much later than the previously mentioned writers, it was also one of the most widely read pieces of Western literature. According to Elizabeth Petrino in her article, Illusion, Echo, and Literary Influence in Emily Dickinson, reading her, po her poems and letters with sensitivity to ways that they evoke other literary works, sometimes overtly, sometimes in subtle, barely discernible ways, enable us to appreciate her ongoing dialogue with other writers and her creative reworking of their works. Poem 569 is an example of this. Throughout this poem and much of Dickinson's poetry, she shows a height and breadth of knowledge of poetry, history, philosophy, and mythology. She shows her true scholarship. Dickinson's poetry has been compared to Horace, a Roman poet who lived from 65 BCE to 8 BCE, and has very similar syntax. According to Vincent J. Cleary, Dickinson's writing style seems particularly Horatian, terse, elliptical, enigmatic, and given to a Latinate vocabulary upon which the meaning of individual poems often depends. This makes sense because of her classical education at Amherst Academy and Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, where she took multiple years of both Latin and Greek. If one looks at Horace's odes of 1.11, recognized perhaps more by the tagline Carpe Diem or Seize the Day, the similarities, the similarities to Dickinson's style are more palpable. Comparing this poem to one of Dickinson's, such as 1363, where she discusses death, there are many similarities. According to Cleary, each is relatively brief, each uses a vocabulary that contrasts one-syllable words with two- and three-syllable ones, and finally, each emphasizes keywords, but in different ways. Dickinson by capitalization and dash, Horace by word position. The result is that Dickinson's poem seems most Horatian in language, form, and theme. It might seem strange to compare this 19th century American poet to an early Roman writer, but perhaps not when we recognize how much Dickinson used the Latin language and the rules of Latin in her writing. In Lois A. Cuddy's essay, The Latin Imprint on Emily Dickinson's Poetry, Theory, and Practice, she suggests that if we approach her work with Latin rules in mind, if we in fact put it in Latin, apparent technical errors in her poems no longer shriek, but assume a new dimension of aesthetic integrity and creativity. Because Emily Dickinson had several years of Latin between Amherst and Holyoke, 
Her affinity for Latin shines through in her writing. Cuddy goes on to explain, when Dickinson reverses the syntax and deleted words, she is using the Latin textbook as her guide in recreating poetry modeled after some of the greatest writers in Western history, the poets of the Latin Golden Age. Where some readers have not always understood her poetry or think that she's writing simple poetry, she's actually creating a new type of poetry that takes Latin rules and applies them to poetry in English. How amazing is that? Cuddy finishes up her piece noting Dickinson's innovativeness. She conceived a new aesthetic theory formulated on the principle of fusing Latin with English, undoubtedly an intellectual and artistic achievement surpassing the praises of even her most ardent admirers. Ultimately, Emily Dickinson was a classically educated writer who used her knowledge to create new poetry. Her work was so profound that she is often the most well-known writer being taught from the 19th century. While she was a bit elusive in the areas of her personal life, she left a wealth of rich, innovative, and highly challenging poetry to be consumed by each preceding generation. As Ashley Matthau writes, the world was forever changed by Emily Dickinson.